through to your question, I'll, I'll answer it. So, okay, thanks for coming. Um, the, the, the underlying idea of what we're doing is an ecological concept called resilience. It's an idea that's about 50 years old and it's now spread from ecology to several other sciences. I heard an economist on NPR this morning talking about how to build the resilience of the airline industry by diversifying the number of, character, of, of carriers. That's a fundamentally ecological idea from an economy. So you, you could have could have knocked me off the road with uh, with that. And uh, there 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 is a rigorous mathematical theory, but you'll be happy to hear perhaps that we're not going to cover that today. I, I'm going to try to give you just a, a, a general introduction uh, to the concept. So resilience is the ability of a region, a place on Earth with people and nature uh, to deal with change and continue to thrive. So it's about coping with change. Resilience thinking is a process of building resilience uh, to a desired outcome. That's all you need to know. And I'll give you examples now from that. So the fundamental question to ask is resilience of what? What are we talking about? What specific place on earth, which people, what ecology are we talking about? Um, what's the system? What changes are coming? What do we need to think about uh, in, in the realm of change? And what would be a good outcome? And then, of course, how do we get to that good outcome? Uh, is it, pardon me? Hmm. Should I, what, what should I do here? Click on the left side, yeah. my left, and what, what, what do we think is going to happen? Hmm. Well, you, you want me to advance a slide or Tom or? Sure, there it is. It's not doing it on Zoom. It's just, the, oh, okay, it's just the setup. All right, so what should we do? Should I turn everything off or? Switch, switch the view within Zoom. Let's see, I can record on this view. Just, okay, so I, you want me to stop, should I stop Zoom and start over? All right. Let's go back to screen sharing, okay. Now I get a choice of several different screens. Hmm. Well, I can just quit that and try that one. I don't know. I, I, I think I'm going to try this one. Okay, there we go. And can the recording person can they see what can they see? Yeah. 
Now, okay. Now, should I should I say what I said all over again, or or oh, we can see who is listening, and I could ask the audience, ask an audience member. Okay, I, I don't have that bar. That bar does not occur. I, I don't have that bar. It's not on, not on my computer. We do have something called display settings. Oh, I can swap presenter view no. and slide. Don't do that. I can duplicate the slideshow. I can show the taskbar. Okay. Let me try duplicating the slideshow. Uh, okay, that made screen sharing stop. So let's go back to screen share. And then go back to screen share. We're back. Okay, so kill that. And then you want me to get rid of this thing? Okay, I think I can. Leave. No, 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 don't do that. Okay, don't do that. Oh, here we go. There'll be a way. Hide floating meeting control. Bam, they're gone. Okay, we have no meeting controls. I also have no um, I have no way to control the slideshow, but we'll see what happens. No, that didn't. No, it's, that's gone. Who in the audience would like to give my talk up <laughs> up to the last point you heard? Nobody. Okay. All right. Okay, we've we've lost uh, control of the slides, so. No, they're going, you know, they're you've totally lost control of it. Oh, it's that thing. All right. Okay. We talked about that. So let me let me just go back and remind you where we are. Um, throughout the talk, we need to bear in mind what are we talking about? What's the system on earth that we're having a conversation about? What changes are we thinking about? And what would be a good outcome? And that'll be a, a theme that, that arises uh, throughout the talk. So let's start with the planet, which is a place we've all lived for a long time. Everyone is familiar with, uh, with Earth. And it's uh, this giant uh, ball of, of rocks uh, with a very thin uh, skin of atmosphere over it. And, and we live uh, between the edge of the atmosphere and uh, the top of the rocks. Uh, terms that are likely to come up in the talk are the biosphere, which is all of the living things on Earth, the hydrosphere, which is all the water, salt and fresh on Earth, the lithosphere, which is the layer of rock and soil that, that we stand on, and the atmosphere, which is the air. Uh, that that we breathe, and the and so we're talking about the resilience, a desirable state of that whole system, and that system has changed over time and is likely to continue to change. So we need to think about those changes and how to adapt to them. This graph shows the the average surface temperature of Earth in Celsius. 
And if you don't like Celsius, just multiply by two and three, and you'll be about right. You'll you'll be in the ballpark. And it uh, shows quite a span of time. So at the left end, 65 million years ago was when the mammals got their big chance. A giant asteroid crashed into Earth, dramatically changed the climate for a brief time, and the dinosaurs went extinct. And our ancestors, little shrew and mouse-like things, finally had an opportunity to take over the planet, and, and, and they did. And the climate cooled gradually uh, until uh, about, uh, uh, about 500,000 years ago, and then began these wild swings of temperature which we know as ice and interstadials. And humans finally emerged uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about 3 million years ago there. And the, um, so, so the human story begins then, and you can see it's quite a bit cooler than when we emerge. We emerge in Africa, which is tropical. But then something really remarkable happened to the planet about 15,000 years ago, and it's shown in the yellow, yellow line, was a period of incredible of Earth's temperature and predicted life. And humans did very well during this time. Called the Holocene. And I'll occasionally mention building regimes for the Holocene. So uh, the so agriculture developed early in that period. And when we had agriculture, then it became possible to grow a lot of food in, in, a, in a certain area. And that meant other people could specialize on other things and begin to develop different kinds of technologies and develop urban living. So uh, late in the Holocene, two or three thousand years, we saw the great emerge here in the Americas. Is the Mayas, the mound builder civilizations, and a few others I'm forgetting. In Africa, we had the great Zimbabwe civilization with just incredible engineering feats there. Uh, in Asia, we had uh, uh, the Chinese civilization, the Angkor Wat civilization of Cambodia, the Hindu civilization of uh, of India and, uh, uh, and the emergence of the Muslim civilization in, in the Arab world. And in Europe, in the Mediterranean region, we had the Greek and Roman civilizations emerge. All of those things happened during the Holocene, during this period of remarkable stability. And then we had an, an industrial revolution and our economy continued growing and things were just moving along great. And, uh, but then we noticed about 50 years ago, it's starting to get warmer. It's getting a lot warmer and it's getting warmer uh, faster than normal. And we're now in a situation way over on the right of the graph where we're facing great uncertainty about future temperatures. So every one, uh, every, uh, uh, every option there is from an IPCC scenario, an IPCC climate projection. And we could move into the reddish cone at the top, the much warmer one, and go back to the early Eocene right after the dinosaurs died off. That, that's going to be, it's going to be toasty and, and humid. We, uh, uh, the, 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 the current dominant IPCC projection, the one that is believed it to be business as usual, is the light blue scenario there. And that takes us back to the mid Pliocene, which is warmer, but it's still warmer, but not as, not as bad as the, uh, as the early Eocene. 
And then the uh, darker blue is the, uh, is the um, Paris carbon treaty. So if, uh, if we actually achieve the goals of that treaty, uh, things will flatten out to the darker blue, which is not too far from the house. So the darker blue is back to the house. Um, Oh, talk straight into this. Uh, okay, I'll yeah, I'll I'll, I'll try to remember to, to do that. Should have brought my headphones. Um, so, a major question in front of us right now is how do we build resilience in the Holocene? Um, where would we go in the Pliocene, by the way? It's worth asking, where would people live in the Pliocene? This is a, a study based on IPCC data where the red and orange show places you would not want to live uh, when, if we go to the Pliocene scenario. So th this, is, this is for uh, 2050 to 2100. So, uh, 50 years starting in 2050. In the orange areas in the Amazon, Central Africa, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, India, uh, and parts of, South, of Southeast Asia and, uh, and Australia, that orange is temperatures above human tolerance. So the wet bulb temperature is above 98 degrees Fahrenheit, people die at 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can't live outdoors in, in those parts of the world. The green areas and the areas that get brighter green are areas that are gonna be okay places to live. So uh, a few areas in the Southern hemisphere, but the main one is the Northern hemisphere, a strip of North America that includes Southern Canada and the Northern states. Wisconsin is a place where people could live, and then uh, an area of, of Western Europe. So the good news is we live in a state that's going to be a, a decent place to live uh, in, uh, in, in the Pliocene. The bad news is all 8 billion humans are going to, going to want to live there. And uh, so it's just another reason to think about maybe we don't really want to go to the Pliocene. And we'd like to build resilience to the Holocene. And the answer is, I think, widely known. We replace fossil fuel energy with solar, wind, water, and tidal electricity. So we're not changing the atmosphere so much. And restore the biosphere, restore the natural landscapes of Earth to restore the soil, the atmosphere for a favorable climate, and the hydrosphere for flood control and clean water. So this is the first resilience example. So the resilience we're talking about is resilience of a livable planet. Um, and uh, the way we do it is uh, listed on this slide. These are the changes we need to make. Are you okay with, are you with me? Okay. All right, so let's move on. Well, this is a summary. We'll move on to another example in a minute. So build resilience of, of a favorable climate to greenhouse gases reduce emissions, restore the biosphere. Closer to home, uh, a group of faculty at UW, colleagues and friends of mine and I did a project called Yahara 2070, where we asked, uh, what, do we, uh, what do we like about the Yahara watershed, the, the place where we live, and how would we like to make it more livable in, uh, in, in uh, over the next 60 years. So uh, you're in the Yahara watershed right now. That is the area of land that drains into the Madison Lakes and the Yahara River. And uh, the, uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's where we are. And this is an air photo of it. We ran the project by first talking to people about their hopes and fears for the region, what they thought made the Yahara resilient and what they felt made it vulnerable. And based on public meetings, a series of public meetings and interviews with, with leaders in the region, 
we condensed the views into four stories. And I don't have time to tell the stories today, but uh, you can read them online at, at that website. And uh, they cover a wide range of outcomes for the region, uh, a wide range of human decisions and, and, a, uh, and different mixes of good and bad uh, uh, things. Uh, the, um, and we summarize these as short stories written in the style of an Atlantic Magazine article. They're highly uh, readable. Each story is illustrated by an artist. Uh, the stories were written by real journalists, not by just a bunch of scientists. So they're, they're highly readable. Uh, we made a video of each story. Uh, we also ran a uh, short story contest. We received uh, dozens of submissions from the uh, area. The three winning stories were uh, read on Wisconsin Public Radio and published in Madison Magazine. Uh, and uh, uh, so we really made a big effort to, to get the results of this out and to, and to change the conversation in, in the region about uh, where, where we want to go. A major outcome of Yahara 2070 is that people are very concerned about water quality, deteriorating water quality in the lakes and in our drinking water, the forever chemicals and, and whatnot. And the drivers of change in the water are climate change and the way land is managed, particularly in agriculture. And the, uh, uh, we also ran a series of computer models to try to, to figure out what the, the natural science uh, uh, background of good outcomes would be. And the main thing we found, the most important thing we could do is restore and expand natural land. Try to go to 50% natural land natural land cover in the watershed if we can, certainly better than 35% if we want to have clean water and low flood risk uh, in, in the future. So another resilience story. We want resilience of water quality and low flood risk. Uh, the, the drivers of damage are climate change and the way we manage land and a fix up is simply uh, expand the aerial coverage of, of natural vegetation. Now I'm gonna to turn to the driftless area and this leads into our project. And the driftless area is a four state region uh, that you see at the center of the slide here. So it's Southwest Wisconsin, Southeastern Minnesota, Northwestern, uh, northeastern Iowa and northwestern Illinois. And this map shows the amount of soil loss from the A horizon, the topsoil that grows our food, how much of it has been lost uh, since uh, Euro-Americans colonized uh, the region. So not, not under management by the Native Americans, but since the European our European ancestors came to the region. And you can see that there are some pretty serious hotspots of loss. And um, today we're particularly interested in Grant County in Southwest Wisconsin, which is one of the hotspots of soil loss. What can Southwest Wisconsin le learn from Yahara 2070? Yahara 2070 was done for the region in Dane County, but actually many of the results apply uh, to other parts of the state. And the increase in big rains is causing uh, erosion and harming streams and lakes. And expanded cover of native vegetation conserves soil, slows floods, and improves water quality. Uh, below, I'm showing you uh, uh, two photographs of our land, uh, one in March 2019, where there's uh, a wall-to-wall -wall flood down in the floodplain. And in many parts of Wisconsin, that flood would destroy fences and destroy farmland, erode pasture, and cause big problems. In our land, because of the native vegetation, 
things just jump right back. Um, and we want more of Wisconsin to be like that. And so we're now, we're about to switch to a focus on our own uh, uh, project here. And uh, the, the idea is to expand the area of prairies, wetlands, and forests to restore the soil, mitigate flooding, and help restore the atmosphere. And one reason this works, uh, and perhaps you know this already, is when you walk through a prairie or you walk through a forest, there are beautiful things around you at eye level, but in fact, most of the life is under your feet. And it's under your feet where carbon gets stored. And that carbon is not in the atmosphere when it's stored in, uh, in the soil. And this is how land restoration contributes to climate, but it also keeps the soil in place, uh, reduces flooding, and uh, reduces uh, soil loss in, during uh, times of wet weather. So it's another resilience story. We, we need to restore and expand natural land, so we want to build the resilience of natural lands, agriculture, development. And to do that, we're going to support restoration and conservation activities, like the example we're about to give you. And a big part of that is to recognize that one of the things we get from land, we think of land maybe as just a food producer or a food and wood producer, but land also provides us with clean water, flood control, and a favorable climate. So and right now we don't pay for those, those are not valued. Landowners are not rewarded for providing them, but clean water, flood control and favorable climate are crops. We grow them just like we grow soy or corn. And if our farming system recognized that these benefits are crops and rewarded landowners who produce these things, uh, we, we would move in a better direction. So I'm about to hand it over to Susan. The key point here is natural vegetation builds resilience of the whole system. And that's been our focus. Thank you. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, so I'm going to focus in on the some of the details and particulars of our project. This, uh, of course, everything is within the context. So kind of, I want to mention that this area, the Snow Bottom Natural Area Project is a very large area. This is about 60 miles west of the west side of Madison. And so it's not, not too far, um, but that natural area project encompasses 22,000 acres. So we have within that area, the, the natural area parcels themselves, state natural area parcels themselves. Uh, we have working lands, farms, pastures, uh, agricultural areas. We have conservation land, as you're seeing here on our, our property and others. Um, and, and we have um, you know, areas, it's just, a, it's just all the areas. Uh, as you focus in on um, our land, you'll see it's uh, now consisting of 105 acres along the Blue River. And the Blue River is a river that runs north. So if you're at, if you're on Highway 18 heading out to Wyalusing, um, everything to your right as you're heading out to Wyalusing is uh, all that watershed is traveling up to the Wisconsin. And everything to your left is traveling down to the Pecatonica, Rock River, and so forth in a different complete watershed. So the Blue River is, uh, enters the um, Wisconsin at Blue River, the town of Blue River, and quite a bit north of this area. And uh, the river here is, you can see it's really rather small. It's, it's not too big. You can also see how it gets its name. It's quite, it is quite blue usually um, with the sky reflection. You can see this land is quite varied in terms of its, um, there's bluffs. Those bluffs are about 150 to 170 feet uh, above the floodplain that you're seeing uh, in the foreground there. And then there's a small hill to the right-hand side. And I just want you to notice that to the left of that small hill, there's kind of a band of vegetation. I'll get back to that in a moment, but just keep that in mind 
for uh, later on in the talk. Okay, every slide that I'm going to show you will indicate partners because none of this work happens on its own. We have agencies, uh, Jim and Rose Syme were the uh, stewards of this land before they sold it to us, uh, of some of this land before they sold it to us. We work with Mississippi Valley Conservancy, which is a land trust out of La Crosse that holds the conservation easement on this property and on many others in the uh, area from La Crosse on down through the southwestern part of the state. We partner with USDA and uh, DNR in other ways, so I'll share that. Yes, the conservation easement is in perpetuity. So what it is, is a deed restriction on the land. So in this case, all 105 acres are uh, protected under it. And you set up the uh, conditions of it. Uh, in this case, we have 105 acres. Um, I think 100 and there's, there's like four acres that's not included because it's kind of in, in a space that allows the farmer next to us to um, access a field that he can't access in any other way. But the other acres are all protected, no development. Actually, in this case, there will be no um, electricity or uh, water, water sourcing. Uh, we have, do have a rustic cabin, and I do mean rustic, uh, but no utilities will be brought into that. Uh, and that is in perpetuity. So any person who owns this land in, in the future will have to follow and abide by those same deed restrictions. This is recreational property. So no, it doesn't. I mean, the value of the land is less than if it were developed. And that's how they determine the value of the uh, conservation easement by comparing the value of the land as it is now to what it would be, what it would be if it were home sites. Okay, so when we first, we purchased part of this land about 20 years ago, and at the time, you can see the Blue River there running uh, um, across. And at the time, that stream was entirely lined with large trees, box elders, probably willows, and some other, other um, types of trees, fast growing trees that had taken root along the river. And so the river banks were shaded and really not very resilient to some of the flooding that you might imagine a picture of before. Uh, that was coming through there. The shading like that, of course, suppresses the ground vegetation, so that you often have bare soil, et cetera, underneath those. And um, our first, one of our first memorable events with this property was Crowd Unlimited coming out with a huge crew of about 40 um, people, members of their club, to cut down all those trees. And then you can see some burn piles there in the, on the floodplain. We literally, it was literally in the winter and we literally burned all those trees up on those burn piles. You still see a few stacked over there that were yet to be burned. Uh, that was a huge project, but what that did right away was it opened up the, the ground and opened up the vegetation along the, um, along the stream. Anything, any suppressed plants were able to grow then. So it provided a little bit of uh, protection for the stream itself. Um, but, this is what we had, the situation here. The top uh, left there, you can see that rather tall, steep bank where the river had come through and slumping of the sediment. Of course, that's going into the stream and carried on downstream. Uh, so this was a situation when uh, we embarked and this was when the Symes were coming uh, the, the west side. Uh, so we were working together with them, with Jake Plemer, who was a, uh, a um, gentleman who lives in Montfort there nearby and is a real, um, just a very amazing person for organizing these stream restoration projects. So this was a joint project, Trout Unlimited, NRCS, um, the DNR was involved and Dave Rowe excavating is a very um, specialized, he's a very specialized excavator. Uh, what they did was they dropped about um, 278 dump truck loads of rock along the river Dave tapered back the banks here, the cut banks, and armored those, um, our armored the stream side. So you can see it tapers back from the stream. And then there's a, uh, the rocks right there covered the soil that kind of help armor the, 
the stream bank. Of course, there's going to be change over time, but what this provides is, uh, it prevents is that kind of erosion up there. So you can see this had a pretty small footprint because the quarry where all this rock came from is literally on the land that's our neighbor next to the west of us. And the um, spoils, all that soil that was removed from tapering the banks was put along that hill that I pointed out to you earlier. There was about 300 loads, between 275, 300 loads of spoils that were uh, dropped along that hill and then graded out. So it's kind of interesting if you went there today, you'd find some streamside uh, plants that were still in that soil along that hill kind of way out of place, but you'll know why since I just told you. Um, so you can see here that the next project after laying the rock and tapering the soil was to seed the area. There's still plant material within that bare soil that roots and you know, different seeds that take from the vegetation that was there before, but we, we added a lot of seed at both times, both the earlier period of, um, you know, releasing the, um, you know, releasing the plants from the first, uh, you know, the first project and then this project and on, we are, we are kind of continually continuing to oversee this. But this was a major seeding project here. And you can see they've laid some mulch down there. It was uh, hand, we did hand broadcasting, tractor, um, tractor drilling. Uh, Jake here with the red, that red thing on his front is uh, one of those um, spanning things that you wear on your front and it spreads the seeds around like a fertilizer spreader. Uh, this was mulched along the edge there with straw that was blown out to um, kind of hold that. And then you can see that that was in the fall in September and it was not growing. There was cover crop in there, but it was not growing very much uh, that first fall, of course. And here you see it the following spring at the top left there, that is the stretch of river. You can st still see the mulch a little bit. Um, and you can see how the river is tapered there instead of having cut bank. And then this is the end of the, that same season here on um, 2009, where you can see the vegetation quite uh, has qu come quite, um, you know, it's really holding that bank now. Both of those pictures actually are from that um, September. Um, so just to show you what happens, um, the, the, the one at the upper, the upper left there is one of those raging floods. This was actually the summer just before we did the, restoration. Um, just to give you an idea of like, if you get, that was a, a case that June where we had about 12 inches of rain within uh, 10 days in that area. And of course it looks like this, that that would normally just be the stream, but now it looks like a lake traveling quickly across the floodplain. What happens there is the larger plants do get knocked down. They're, they're growing, so say like five or six foot plants would get knocked down. The small plants actually just stand. And as soon as the flood is gone, they, they are still able to grow. So that can, this can move a lot of logs and a lot of sediment and that kind of thing. So we do see that, especially with larger um, storm events. But the other pictures show uh, post um, restoration. So this one at the lower left here, uh, you can see the stream is quite a bit out of its banks or way up on its banks, but it's still um, not, it's still not taking any soil. It's not eroding anything from the land. And the other one was just, a, uh, I had a snapshot Wisconsin camera and uh, just happened to, a deer triggered it one morning at 5 a.m. and the river was 40 yards out of its bank. Uh, the, the deer came down the hill and went, whoops, the river was like going by at the bottom of the hill, which it normally doesn't. And then at, a couple hours later, it, the river had receded back to its banks and or close to it, and the deer were back out on the floodplain itself. So uh, besides the, the stream is quite important, as you can see that was a lot of work. Uh, and this has been, uh, Trout Unlimited has been spearheading uh, stream restoration work along probably 10 or 12 miles of that um, river now, uh, look, working with farmers, working with um, people who uh, have pasturing, just pasturing, uh, working with um, other conservation owners and, and working with people who have just become interested in this kind of resilience, uh, building this, own kind of re this, this kind of resilience on their own land. We had one, um, one acquaintance who 
with one of those big floods lost an acre of his pasture in the one event. And that was about the time that he decided he might be interested in having some restoration, having a stream restoration project done on his, on his land. So there's um, the land is also telling us what it needs. Um, so some of the other practices that we use and that all fit into this project, uh, prescribed fire, of course, we don't do, we usually are working with some companies to do that because these are fairly large areas. Um, you can see one of our prescribed fires here that I think was um, 2020. And then uh, we remove invasive plants and we remove a lot of brush and sometimes actually thinning trees and even native trees to create a uh, better savanna habitat and prairie habitat, of course. So this is a pile of um, yellow parsnip in the middle there uh, with Steve and our, um, and our dog who doesn't really help with the parsnip project, but he likes to, he likes to look for voles in that area. We pile it up this way. We're usually, um, we're removing it when it's coming into, um, when it's flowering and coming into seed, we pile it like that, dry it out and just burn it in one spot so that we, all the seeds and everything are right there and we can just get rid of them um, instead of having them scatter around. The two things that we spend the most, the two weeds, if you will, that we spend the most time working on, which came in there about 15 years ago, and, um, and the parsnip, which comes in probably most likely on floods you know, parsnip has really, in the last 10 years or so, has really just exploded in its um, presence and its ubiquity. Um, and I'm not, and I'm, I'm not sure that isn't related to the climate, to the climate time, time period. Um, so we spend a lot of time with that, mainly with the garlic mustard. We have garlic mustard in areas that are just really high. So we're not, we're doing a lot of hand pulling, monitoring, uh, you know, seeing if the trees that deer are taking in um, along their deer trails. That's the first place you'll find it. Squirrels bring it on, so you'll find it around a tree. So you've got to be watching for those kinds of things. Um, extensive and try to um, mitigate its effect on the woodland wildflowers as well. The other thing that we have been able to do is monitor plants. Um, we've had a bird today come out to do bird surveys. That's been really helpful to know what's there. Uh, and students, so I've listed some universities and schools. Students have come out to do surveys of land. So we have a tiny little land sale that are about a millimeter long, endangered species. Um, that are living in the soils around the bluff. Um, the fish and the water quality also um, monitored by students from Platteville and also some sixth graders from Elliott Grant Middle School that's done that over a period of years. And it's really interesting to have that. And then it, it's helpful also, um, Steve has logs. Of, uh, so we were just looking at 2008 because that was the year of the of the restoration to see kind of what were the flow of activities during that year. It's kind of interesting to see. Uh, so it's worth it to keep those kind of records, just kind of, you, you can't remember everything. And it's been really helpful to have those to go back to. One of the things that I've been pretty interested in in the last um, 12 years or so is documenting pollinators and um, other insects because I do my uh, bumblebee documentation with photography. And so then you end up with photographs of all the other insects that you see visiting flowers, and it's been pretty fascinating. These are all native um, insects, except for the honeybee there. And we do have feral honeybees, a huge feral honeybee colony um, on one of our big pines. So those could be domestic or they could be feral. I'm not sure which one this is. The rusty patch bumblebee is there, the second one on the top left there. And then this is the yellow bumblebee queen, this one on the top, very top left corner, visiting a lupin. That is a bumblebee species as well. We have about, I think, eight species of bumblebees at, uh, that I've documented at the land so far. That is a tiger beetle. Very, it, yeah, some people think it might be an emerald ash borer, but no, it's a tiger beetle. And they're usually out, it's not really common to see them on the rocks like that. And 
um, pretty common to see them early in the season. So you can get identification from photos and I've done that with a lot of things. Of course, these are all pretty familiar ones, but um, you can just keep building up a, a library of them. I would encourage anyone who's interested in bumblebees to look into Bumblebee Brigade, which is a photo-based um, community science project that the DNR runs. And we've had great growth with that over the last five years and lots of great information and participation and documentation for the statewide knowledge of statewide um, distributions. So uh, just to summarize, we have um, the native vegetation as much as, um, as we can restore and as much as we can keep um, building it. The plants are the basis for the food web. They're the basis for, um, they're the kind of the basis for everything else. So starting with plants is a good way to go. Um, and they store carbon and they will hold the soil and they will, and if you can uh, prevent invasive plants, or, you know, if you can have a healthy uh, native vegetation, then invasive plants, will be less of a problem with your help. Uh, and then those are all part of the biosphere, which will help restore the soil and provide clean water and favorable climate. So that is our presentation. I have this slide, which maybe could be, um, I don't know, Tom, if you can image that or whatever, there are, there's, a, there's a, some references, some books that are very interesting that resources for native plants and pollinators is actually a link to a handout that you could get if you want more information about this uh, or you want a copy of that link sent to you, just email me at my email address up there and I will send it to you. Unless there's a way to kind of duplicate this slide for folks. Yes, copy of that link. Just <laughs> you put her take take you got your abacus back to it. All right. Any questions? <sighs> yeah. I am uh well, okay. There are a few things I like to harvest. I'm not, I mean, I'm a native plant gardener and I always kind of duck that question professionally because I've seen so many times when people gotten the IDs wrong. And so then I'm, if I'm recommending something, they might get the wrong plant and eat that. And then and I've seen too many cases of people thinking it's something and not, you know, and eating it and then it, it's a problem. Uh, but I, we harvest, uh, I harvest a lot of berries. We get morels. That's one benefit of the garlic mustard season. It's usually around morel time. So they're, you know, you can't say for sure where the morels are, but um, if they're there, you can find them. Uh, the, the rains are right. I don't do any other mushroom um, collecting than that. Um, not deer. Mm -hmm. At this point. Well, we do have we do have a lot of, you know, there's, there's predators. So we have, I mean, there's coyotes. And so as far as like what levels of, um, what levels of the food chain we have, um, there's coyotes at Bobcat. Um, so my snapshot Wisconsin camera was really helpful. I mean, there's tons and tons of deer, of course, but interesting sightings within the deer, um, like white ones and different, you know, different behaviors that you can pick up on the, on the camera, really a great program. Well, especially in their behavior. Well, yeah. the 
But not very many because the kind of Right. Well, there are. There are a lot of trout, and even even right as the right as the you know as that work was going on, they were monitoring trout in the stream, and the and the trout were there. Interesting thing about that point is, and and I had the same. I had the same concern actually, like what would be the effect on the stream of removing the shade? Um, Long-term, everything is getting warmer. We have right upstream from this property, there is a property that is uh, where the stream really meanders. It's a very flat place. And that farmer has a pretty much a lowland forest along the stream corridor, which is rather wide because of this meandering. And that's where the water is coming out of. We are pretty close to the very top of this stream. Like there's not too many miles upstream from our um, land. And so that water is coming out of seeps and springs and then coming into the stream. And I don't know if there's, I don't know if Chris um, Wright would have temperature data for it, but the, but the trout have been, the, the trout have been, um, as far as I know, Pretty much all the time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. And and so it's for a view. Yeah. And that's actually, I mean, that becomes important for uh, like an OLX2 with the link up north where you, if you have trees and they're falling into the lake, it's just going to get at the fishery, basically, and it discourages the big get the bank. So, yeah, I think the I think that the stream that the lake has looks kind of like uniform. It has a lot of different features underwater and stop logs and things come out and other parts of it are just like this actually displays a variable, you know, variable, yeah, a variable, it, 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 that's, that's kind of the most real, that's what, yeah, and then of course the stream is a tree, because that's what it's like, it's like a gravity bottom, you know, gravel bottom, that came, came down and then Roger rebuilt it today. We haven't had anything built out. Sometimes, but not like that. Or I mean, I'm just thinking on a three maybe. So, um, well, actually, there was a book actually, you know, going out had a tree down there that went into the river, and we had a very extremely big tree. Well, um, there's definitely an upstream hotel that there was an upstream hotel at the moment. It's a little bit closer than the upstream hotel. Oh, I love this guy. He's a good guy. You know, it's like, you know, there's a little bit of a shock when you can't get out of the house. So it's just a kind of thing. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I didn't have anything to look around for. I feel like when you live, Magic Florida. And the diversity of that community is really 
I had a garlic biscuit problem a long time ago, and it was like a bite came out, and he had a tool, but he had actually patented it, um, and it kind of looked a lot like a crowbar, and he would push it down into the ground on a PA, and cut the amount of just a long piece of it. Um, yeah, it was left a wood down. Okay. It was steel, and, and and it would be it would pull. Oh. Oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
but if you were to do this on a large scale, this is what kind of the on the bonds? And it's made. And if you go to your own people, you can join the very easily. And uh, they'll, they'll uh, you know, they'll identify in the program, put in the insight to do the survey. And, uh, and they're happy with the volunteer and the same time. It's a small gap. So it's not that it's really a political part of the thing that we're How many satellites would you get to a hundred or two hundred or two hundred? Would you get to what you're saying? Or to wait for the next? Whatever we have. Yeah. Um, well, we do have on this on this property. There is a, it's one of the reasons it was not designed in the first place. Uh, was that it has a significant Native American um, site on it. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Once you drill down through the through the um, flood plain. Uh, there was there was mining up on one of the hills, at, not on my property, but like kind of up there in the, in the eastern section. Uh, there was a paint factory down a, a stream from our land. We, we know that about the history of my people, where it's Highway I, and then it goes up to Highland. And right down there along the river, there was a paint factory. They created paint from that rock and then burning it and then. Getting the pigment, yeah. yeah. So that's known. The the land, the yeah, extract of title for this is um, 1837. Was the um, first abstract title for this property? Well, that was the kind of. Um, 
hear about how it's much toiler than offer to someone that calls it the word of the Holy Word of God is 12, 72, almost the different elevations. Yeah, if you go further, it, your whole understanding is really the only thing that I have on the field. Once it gets down in the room, you keep moving, you know, because there'll be flying Dallas. periodically with that down and stuff like that. And you, it's a moving, dynamic system, and eventually it all ends up smothering short of the problem. This is an interesting one. Isn't it interesting? Sorry, I'll close it. Our bluffs are sandstone at the top, yeah. but further. Further uphill, so as you're coming down toward the Big River from Montford, there's limestone at that level. So there's limestone right. above, the and, then it's, mm -hmm, and then it's sandstone, and then there's a limestone, another limestone layer yeah. that's on yeah. like the saddle kind of. You know, I I don't know statistics. Probably not. But some I I think there's some anybody any geologist geologist. I think maybe flying them over the area. Yeah, I just can't remember. Yeah, it's. Uh,